All right, thank you. If you don't mind, open up your Bibles back to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. And uh, this morning, Brother Walter read for us a uh, passage of Scripture. And uh, David is trying to return the ark to Jerusalem. And uh, the ark represents the presence of God. God gave specific instructions to Moses on how to build the ark, how it was supposed to be shaped, uh, what was supposed to be on the ark. Preacher, can I have number one, please? Uh, God gave Moses specific instructions on, on all to do with the ark. And uh, the children of Israel had the ark for, for, for several years, for hundreds of years, there in the tabernacle at Hebron and uh, in all in, in other different places of, uh, of Israel. Uh, and then Eli becomes the judge of, uh, of Israel, and his sons were very wicked. If you know the story, you read in 1 Samuel, uh, the first two chapters. And uh, Israel went out to battle against the Philistines, and uh, the two sons of Eli, I said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's bring the ark of God, uh, with the presence, which represented the presence of God in the nation of Israel. Let's bring the ark of God with us out into battle. That's not where the ark was supposed to be. The ark was supposed to remain in the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest had permission to enter into the presence of the Holy of Holies in the ark of the covenant and the ark uh, that was there. But uh, Israel lost that battle that day and the ark of the covenant was taken by the Philistines. And if you read 1 Samuel chapters 1, 2, and 3, you'll realize that the Philistines, uh, in uh, chapter 4 and 5, I apologize, but uh, the Philistines wanted nothing to do with the Ark of the Covenant. Why? They put the Ark in their in, in a temple of one of their gods, and uh, I believe it was Dagod, uh, the god to the fish, and uh, they come in the next morning, and uh, he, he's bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant. And they say, well, this is a little strange preacher. Uh, this big giant, uh, uh, you know, 15-foot statue of this god, and half man and half fish and, and he's bowing down in the presence of the ark and uh, that might have been just accident maybe somebody accidentally toppled it over they set it back up the next day they walk in the tower the, 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 the statue again was, was bowing uh, towards the ark but this time its hands were cut off and its feet were cut off and the head was cut off and they realized uh, that didn't happen on accident and uh, it was the presence of God showing the Philistines who the true God was the Philistines moved it around and, and God struck and uh, the Philistines with disease everywhere that the ark went, letting them know that the presence of the one true God was in their city, was in their countries. The Philistines finally said, look, we've had enough. Let's just give Israel back their God. We defeated them, but we don't want anything to do with them. And so they said, let's figure out a way to show that this is, to actually see for ourselves one last time if this is the true God. And they said, we're going to take two, uh, two cows that have just, just had two calves born and we're going to put them and connect them to this car. And if you know anything about a cow that's just had a baby, uh, they're not wanting to separate from that little calf. And they said, we're going to hook it up to this, uh, to this, uh, to, to the uh, to the cart, and we're going to place the Ark of the Covenant on uh, the Ark, and we're going to let the cows go, and wherever it goes, it goes, and we don't want to have to do with it anymore. They did that, and they placed it, and they put uh, gold and sacrifices there on the Ark, and sure enough, those cows started walking towards Israel, the opposite direction of where those calves were, revealing again that it was the presence of of God. Several, uh, almost a hundred years have passed now since that time and uh, the Ark of the Covenant has, uh, Samuel has led the children of Israel for 40 years and Saul has been the king of Israel and now David's been the king of Israel and realizes, hey, we need to bring the Ark back to Jerusalem. David had built Jerusalem, it's called the city of David and he said, I want the presence of God in Jerusalem. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but to me that sounds, that sounds very good. Hey, the king wants God's presence there beside him and build a house and build a temple for God. But what happened is we read in 2 Samuel chapter 6, if you look one more time in verse number 7, uh, verse number 6, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error and there he died by the ark of God. You read the first five verses and David is getting these, this ark and he's excited. He's, uh, he's worshiping God and, 
Man, they're bringing the presence of God back to Jerusalem where it belongs and uh, to be in the temple and so that the whole country can worship and, and rejoice and be excited together that God's presence has once again been returned uh, to the right spot. The ark is where it belongs. And next thing you know, they hit a bump on the road and Uzzah reaches out with good intentions but to stop the ark from falling over. And God commanded the Israelites not to touch it, not to look upon it, not to look inside of it. And when Uzzah put his hands on the ark, he dropped dead instantly. And all the worshiping and all the excitement instantly stopped. You can imagine in this room today if we were uh, preaching, if I was preaching and we're excited and uh, you know everybody's amening and everybody's with the service and the next thing you know uh, that somebody on this platform, hopefully it's not uh, preach or Brother Waldrop, but one of them dropped dead. We would all, it would change our spirit. It would change our attitude. It would change the outlook we had on the service. It would go from being a great service to now being a very sad and very awful service. And David, the Bible even says that David was displeased and David was upset and David didn't understand why God had done this. Today I'm going to preach to you about doing the right things the wrong way. Doing the right things the wrong way. David, I believe with all my heart, had good intentions of doing the right thing. But he went about doing the right thing the wrong way. And it displeased God. In our lives, several times, we can, uh, as, a, as a young person, I thought, hey, I can tell this, this little white lie. You've all heard the saying, the little white lie. And uh, I could tell this little lie because it's going to help somebody feel better about themselves or it's going to help me get out of trouble. And I've thought, hey, it's okay for me to do wrong because I'm doing it right. No, it's not. It's not okay to do wrong for any reason. It's never right to do wrong. But let me tell you this also, even with good intentions, doing, trying to do the right thing, but doing it the wrong way is also wrong. David learned that very hard lesson and very valuable lesson here in 2 Samuel chapter 6. I've heard about this couple. They, uh, they had just gotten married and they just re returned from the honeymoon. They'd been married for a couple months. and uh, They decided to go buy a water bed. They buy this water bed and uh, the husband puts it all together and uh, it's now time to fill, uh, to, I guess you would call it a tank. I don't know what you'd call the mattress, the water part. And Anyway, it's now time to fill it and the instructions say uh, to you know just bring a hose and hook it up to your sink and uh, connect the hose to it and it should take about an hour. The only problem is this young couple lives in an apartment. They don't have a water hose. He goes out to the nearest uh, convenience store, hardware store, buys a hose and hooks it up to the sink and plugs it into the mattress and turns the sink on. And him and his wife decide, hey, we're going to go and get a cup of coffee at Starbucks uh, while, uh, while the mattress is filling up. We'll be back and we'll try to be back a little even earlier than, uh, than an hour, maybe 45 minutes. Well, 45 minutes happens and uh, it goes by and they come back into the house and no, the mattress did not explode but the husband had bought a sprinkler hose instead of a regular hose. What do you think had happened to that house in the last 45 minutes with that sprinkler hose going off? It was soaked. And that man had bought the right thing, but it wasn't the right thing. He had done exactly as the instruction said. He had bought a hose and he had hooked the hose up, but he went about it the wrong way. David has did has, was doing what God wanted him to do. Hey, return the Ark of Covenant back to Jerusalem. David was doing the right thing, but he was doing it the wrong way. David had the right motives. I believe that with all my heart. He had the right attitude. He was even worshiping as he was doing as you can read the first five verses. But David had done a couple other things. David, number one, I believe he had lost his reverence for the holy. God commanded his people and told his people that the ark was very holy, not to look upon it, that, the, that only the high priest could enter into the room where the ark of the covenant was. and uh, It was very sacred. And uh, Moses, it comes all the way back from when Moses was on the mountain actually speaking to God, the Bible says as a friend, face to face. And, and it was very holy, very sacred, and uh, something God wanted his people to take very seriously. And David had kind of lost sight of how important or how holy the ark truly was. The Bible says that there should be a difference between the holy and the profane. And I believe a lot of God's people today, we have lost sight of how reverent and how holy God really is. We do the right thing and we come to church and, and we do what we're supposed to, but we don't do it the right way. We still listen to the wrong music or still watch some ungodly television at home and, and we're doing some things right, but we're not doing everything because why? We've lost sight of how holy God is. The Bible says in 1 Peter, be ye holy for I am holy. You know what happened? And a whole generation of Israelites had gone without witnessing the power of God. A whole generation. You read uh, the Israelite story in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, when the Israelites
Israelites were taken, uh, were, were, were brought out of the land of Egypt and, and they, God had performed many miracles. He had fed them with manna and they crossed through the Red Sea and God provided quail and, and he said he even kept their clothes on their back for 40 years and the shoes on their feet and the children of Israel, what happened is they all passed away after Moses and a generation came up that had not witnessed the power of God. And here this is what happened to Israel. David had not witnessed the, the ark. He had never seen the ark of the covenant in Jerusalem. David has never seen the ark. He, it was, he was not even alive when the ark was taken by the Philistines and they had lost sight of how holy God truly is. Next, I believe that David had forgotten instruction. If, I'm not going to read this for sake of time, but in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 through 22, it's in the book of the law. It's, it's in the Pentateuch. This is a very holy book for the Israelites. and uh, The Israelites had the instruction instructions of how to handle the ark in Exodus chapter 25 verses 8 through 22 is very very specific uh, they had create God told them when they made the ark it was this big giant you could look at it as a box about as wide as this pulpit and there were two angels bowing down and their wings were touching on top and there was two rings on each on each uh, one ring on each corner of gold ring and the instructions were for them to take a pole and run it through that ring and uh, to have a Levite on each corner carrying the ark of the covenant and very specific God wasn't saying this is how you should do it or this might be a good way. No, God says this is the only way to do it. And David had forgotten the instructions that God had given him. You know, Christians will go through life and uh, we'll forget sermons that we've heard. We'll forget verses that God has given us in the Word of God. And we'll forget the instructions that God has given to us. Or we'll forget the instructions that our parents have given to us. David had either forgotten or worse, he simply ignored the instructions of God. Man, that's rampant today and today's society. Hey, if we don't like what God says, we don't have to listen to it. We can just ignore it and everything is going to be fine. Let me tell you something. David learned the hard way. He was doing right. Man, David was doing what God wanted him to do, but he ignored or forgot the instructions of how to do it. Let's not ignore the words and the law of God. Maybe they thought, hey, if they had the right intentions, it doesn't matter how they do it, that God will bless them anyway. Let me, that's not how God works. God says, I want you to do it a specific way, and this is how it's going to be done. Next, I think that David might have forgotten that carelessness had cost them before. This wasn't the first time that somebody had died because of the ark. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, everybody turn over there if you don't mind. We read in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Now let's look over in 1 Samuel chapter 6 in verse number 19. 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse number 19. I'm going to read, but when you find your place, you can follow along. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 19, the Bible says, And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. 50,000 and seventy men have died. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. This was not the first time that somebody had died because of mishandling the ark of the covenant. David should have, as king, number one, known the instructions that God had given to him. Number two, he should have remembered, hey, this is God is very strict and God has told us how to do it. God said not to look upon it. God said not to, uh, to touch it. God gave us instructions on how to carry it. He should have known better, but he had forgotten how carelessness had cost the Israelites before with the Ark of the Covenant. Now Uzzah is dead. He's lying there. And, and Uzzah was a son of the men, uh, one of the men that the Ark had been residing in for, for uh, several years in, in, in Israel. Israel, but now he's dead because of forgetting what, uh, how serious God is about his laws and his commandments. Not only were there people killed because uh, looking into the ark, but the ark was lost. I told you the story of Eli's sons, but it was lost because they mishandled the ark. The ark should have never left uh, the Holy of Holies. The ark should have never been brought into battle in the first place. David, yes, he had the right motives. David, yes, had the right attitude. And David, yes, was worshiping as he was carrying the ark, but he was doing it the wrong way. He had lost sight of the reverence, uh, uh, lost reverence for the holy of God and uh, the holiness of God, and he had forgotten or ignored the instructions that God had given. Them. They had also forgotten about how God had already uh, smitten the Israelites for mishandling the Ark of the Covenant. And I believe next, David replaced obedience for laziness. You know, it's very simple in my mind thinking, hey, why would David place it on the cart? Well, uh, it's 10 miles from where the Ark of the Covenant was uh, to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know about you, but taking a ride or walking 10 miles is very simple for me. Let's ride all the way. My sister just, uh, just ran a marathon, the Great Wall of China uh, marathon 
marathon, 26.2 miles with over 5,000 stairs. Uh, that's just crazy. That's dumb. Who would do that to their self? I don't know. I told my sister, uh, somehow she's her brain's been disconnected from the rest of her body. She thinks she's uh, something. I say, no, you're just, you're, just, you're just a little dumb. Okay, that's all it is. Uh, who would put their body underneath that? I, I would say, hey, I'm, I'm a lazy person. Yes, if I can uh, ride 10 miles or walk 10 miles, I will go there. But David replaced obedience for laziness. Hey, you know what? Uh, walking with God sometimes, Christian, it, it is not easy. It's not easy. You know, doing right is not always uh, is not always easy. You know, it's not easy. Uh, it, it is real easy to be part-time Christian or to be Christian at church or Christian when you're around church people or, uh, or, or Christian sometimes, but it's very hard for us to live a holy lifestyle. It's very hard for us to forgive one another. Very hard. Very, very hard. It's very hard for us to love one another. God says for us to love. And it's hard for us to do, but God doesn't want us to replace obedience for laziness. Just because it's easier going through life without forgiving somebody. Just because it's easier going through life not loving people the way you should. Just because it's easier going through life not helping out anybody else that has needs or struggles or, or trials in life. It's easier staying to yourself, living a separated life, saying I don't want to worry about anybody else. You know that's real easy but it's not the way that God wants us to do it. God wants us to live an obedient life. You know it takes time it takes work to pray and walk with God. Praying is very hard work. Uh, sometimes uh, you know, God always answers, but God doesn't always answer exactly when we think He should. Or God doesn't answer just because we prayed for two seconds before we got into the car. No, God wants us to take some time and walk and fellowship with Him. It takes work. You know, we can't make it uh, on somebody else's Christianity or somebody else's walk with God. You're going to have to get a walk with God on your own. You know, but it was easier to move the world's way. You know, David uh, saw the way the world did it, and he said, hey, you know what, that sounds pretty good. But you know, one thing they had to have, uh, uh, Uzzah died because he touched the ark, so you know what that tells us? That nobody had touched the ark to place it upon the cart. They had to have taken poles and run it through the golden rings and, and picked it up and placed it on the ark. So they had done half of what they were supposed to do, but they didn't finish. They were saying, hey, let's, it's okay for us to, to be a little bit lazy here as long as we're obedient. No, not correct. Hey, let's make sure that we don't replace obedience for laziness. I believe next, David not only did all that, but I believe that David accepted the thinking of man over the clear commands of God. Hey, David, that's how the Philistines carried the Ark of the Covenant. Hey, hey, David, that's uh, the, 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 the people that God had killed and the people that God had struck down and the gods that had been laid out on the floor. That's how they handled the Ark of the Covenant, David. That's not how God commanded you in Exodus to carry the Ark. And you know what we do as Christians? We go about copying and trying to duplicate the traditions of man. Hey, let's so, so worried and so focused on how man does things and so focused and worried about how men sing songs in church or how we feel good or how we do this or how everybody else this is just the way the world works today God says no I'm the same yesterday today and forever David I've asked you to do it this way and this is the way that I want you to do it but David had accepted the world's thinking accepted the world's philosophy and he copied it hey David what do you think is going to happen when you copy somebody that God just killed for the, what they done hey David the, the Philistines were, were killed and struck with disease for carrying and moving the ark the way that they did. David, if you want to copy them, that's fine, but don't be upset, David, if your life ends up the same as the Philistines. Hey, David, don't be mad and upset because us is now dead and, and all everybody's upset because uh, God has, uh, has told them that he's displeased with them. David, God was displeased with the Philistines and you copied them. Let's not focus so much about copying what the world does and, and dressing the way the world does and, and being successful in the world's eyes. Let's make sure that we are obeying God's command. You know what happened is when Uzzah died, it caused the Israelites, hey, uh, David came back to Jerusalem and said, hey, let's, uh, let's do a little investigating. Let's find, where's, where's the Bible? Give me the Bible. And this is not in the Word of God, but I believe that David came back and he said, hey, let's find out exactly what we're supposed to do. 
Now this is, uh, again, this was not me, so don't tell you. Well, usually, you know, preachers will give illustrations and you'll think, is that him? This was not me, but I know another young man that bought a lawnmower, a pushing mower. Why would you buy a pushing mower? I don't know. I'm lazy. I like a riding mower, but he bought a pushing mower and put it all together and uh, put the gas and uh, he had made sure that it, uh, it had the, the oil in it and, and he pulled that cord, through, he pushed the prime pump and he pulled the cord, pulled the cord, pulled the cord, third time it cranked, man, it was perfect. It was running and that mower, he was so proud of himself. Well, he lets go of the, the handlebar and the mower's supposed to cut off. Doesn't cut off. Doesn't. It keeps running. It's running and running and running and running. He realized, oh, uh, I might have put something together the wrong way. I might have, uh, I probably should have looked at the instructions. He picks up the instruction booklet and he opens up the front page. And the first thing he says is, now that you have decided to read the instructions. And it goes on to explain to him how he was supposed to uh, put together the lawnmower. You know, in life sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll go about doing what we think is right. Maybe have the right motives. Maybe have the right intentions. Maybe have the right spirit. Maybe have the right even worshiping God while we're doing it. But we fail to follow the instructions that God, have given, give, that God has given us. And what happens? I don't know exactly what happens. The Bible says uh, that the... Uh, uh, where is it? Verse number 7. Uh, or verse number 6. His hand... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, verse number 6. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Why did the oxen shook, uh, shake the, uh, the car? I don't know. Did they hit a bump in the road? I don't know. Did they, uh, did they, were they scared? Did they see something? Were they startled? I don't know. But I do know this, is that when people have problems, when people hit a bump in the road, or when the, their, their car or their life gets shaken up, and, and God reveals to them, hey, I'm not happy with the way you've been doing some things, that's when people want to investigate. Let's do it the right way. What I want to do today is I want us to open up our eyes, and let's, let's do investigating before. Hey, before that problem comes, before that trial comes, before the bump in the road comes, before the trial in your life comes your way, and the, the cart gets shaken, and, and uh, and, and things in your life get all out of haywire, let's investigate to see how God wants us to live our life. I know this is true. David, you cannot remove God and His way and be right. It doesn't matter if you're doing it for the right reasons. It doesn't matter if you have uh, all the right intentions. It doesn't matter if you have the right spirit. It doesn't matter if you have the right attitude. It doesn't matter if you have even a worshiping spirit. If you remove God, don't be surprised that God does not bless it. Four areas in life. All that was introduction to teach you or preach to you this sermon this morning about doing the right thing the wrong way. I believe there's four areas in our life that we're so busy trying to do it right and we have the right intentions but we're going about it the wrong way. This is Education Sunday number one, I believe, that we're going about education the wrong way. Going about education the wrong way. Man, the world today uh, is so focused on uh, uh, accreditation and so focused on uh, making sure that uh, we get this and Common Core and uh, No Child Left Behind and all these programs that the government tries to instill and, and they're trying to teach our children. And do, are they doing with the right intentions? Absolutely. I believe they want our children to grow up and, and be knowledgeable. They want our country not to fall behind. I believe that people have the right intentions, but they are going about it the wrong way. They have removed God from the education system in America and is one, and we're wondering why our education is failing. Because we have removed God. Because we're so focused on receiving man's approval for what we're doing. Hey, you need to be accredited. It's Temple Christian Academy. We're unaccredited school with the state of Mississippi by choice. Not because we're podunk and not because we're country, but because we don't want to be accredited by the state of Mississippi. We don't want government officials coming and telling us you need to do this and you have to do that. Should we have some checks and balances? Absolutely and we do and we want to provide a quality education for our young people but I'm not going to let the, the world tell me how to educate our children. God has given us instructions in the Bible and we have the right intentions with education, with public education but we're going about it the wrong way. And you say well how come God's not for it? Because God has been removed. 
In the 60s, they removed prayer and the Bible from public schools. Today, uh, a Muslim is allowed to pray to Allah three times during the school day, but yet a Christian is not allowed to bow their head and pray in the classroom before test. Uh, a Christian is no longer allowed to carry a Bible even in their book sack or even in their locker. They will be trouble, they will be punished and they'll get in trouble for simply having the Word of God with them. And we're surprised and we're saying, how come this is going wrong? And hey, we have the right intentions, you do, but you're doing it the wrong way. Why are there drugs and how come there's uh, so much uh, filth and, and horrible things going on that we don't even want to talk about in mixed company in a public school? It's because we're doing it without God. Christians, uh, teachers even aren't allowed to pray before class gets started. There's no mention of God at all and they teach that, uh, that evolution is a fact and not that it's a theory and they refuse to allow anybody to teach anything other than evolution in our public schools and we wonder why God is not blessing America in the education system because we have removed God from, the situ from, from education. Hey, the, the public school system is teaching humanism that man is naturally good. Man's not naturally good. The Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, they teach that uh, man, you know, if we're, it, it, the reason why we're messed up is because uh, uh, somebody said just the other day that uh, you know these uh, small town people are just clinging to their religion and clinging to their guns. Well, you know what? Uh, we are because we're afraid of what's happened because we've removed God from the education system. Not only with accreditation and teaching humanism and evolution and all those other things, but you know what they've also done is they've removed the godly way to correct a child in the public school. Hey, the public school teacher has no authority and no ability to correct or uh, to punish a child in the school, especially the godly way. And we wonder why God is not for us. We wonder why uh, we even maybe get upset at God. God, why is this happening? Because God has been removed. Right intentions, absolutely. Great teachers, I, I, I promise you, I know that there's great teachers. My grandmother was a teacher in the public school for several years. and I know there's great Christian people as teachers and principals in the public school system. But when you remove God, no matter what your intentions are, you will not come with a blessed result. The second way I think that we've, uh, we, we're going about things the wrong way, even if it's the right way, uh, the right thing to do, but I believe in parenting. Parenting. I believe parents in America have stopped doing things the Bible way and started doing things the way they think is right. They've listened to the psychologists and the doctors and the scientists of today that says we need to be careful not to uh, be careful not to hurt the spirit of a child. Uh, I'm going to tell you one thing: the spirit of a child needs to be broken. If it's not broken, they will live their life uh, uh, consistently breaking uh, breaking rules and. Uh, forsaking authority and not having any respect of authority that God has placed in their lives. Hey, how come, uh, how come there's so many people, young people riding in the streets of Baltimore? How come there's so many people doing wrong in America today? You know why? Because they had no respect of authority because parents have stopped doing it the godly way. Well, Johnny, you're only a parent of one. I know. My child's only 21 months old. I'm going to have another uh, a son being born two weeks from Monday. I'm not saying this because I'm an expert. I'm saying that America as whole, uh, we, we've We've gone away from the Word of God, and we're surprised that our young people aren't turning right, uh, turning out right. When you remove God, it doesn't matter if you have the right intentions; you're going to end up with the wrong result. They've taken away discipline. Parents don't correct, and instead of the rod, they're they're giving their child drugs, mind-altering drugs in America today. Uh, parents have this mindset that my child is perfect, and and they don't do anything wrong. And the reason why their grades are bad is because the teacher's not doing their job right, or the reason why that my child got in a fight is because that kid is not the right type of child for my, my kid to hang around. No, your child's not perfect. No, your child is the reason why your child is suffering. Your child is the reason that he's not paying attention in class. And your child is needing discipline in their life. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 24, the Bible says a parent that, re that refuses to discipline their child actually hates their child. You know, but in America today, hey, if we love our kids, they'll do right. No, they won't. Won't do right. You can love on them all you want to, but they need to know that they'll be corrected and that they'll be disciplined in the godly manner that God has set up in His Word. Amen. Hey, it doesn't matter if you're doing it with the right intentions. You're going to have the wrong results. Amen. Hey, David, you're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. You're doing right. Why is Isaiah dead? I did it the wrong way. 
Hey, parents, you, you, want, you love your children, no doubt in my mind at all, and you want what's best for them. But if you're following after the world and the world's way of training a child, you don't be surprised with the results you have. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he shall not depart from them. Not only in parenting, not only in education, if we've removed God and doing the right things the wrong way. I believe as Christians that we're walking with God the wrong way. Hey, we have the right intentions. Hey, we're coming to church. and Hey, we're, we're sitting in the pew. It's Sunday morning. I'm in my spot. But we don't read the Bible throughout the week. Only time we pray is before the food. And, and we forget that most of the time. We spend very little time actually communicating and having a relationship with God. Hey, we only call upon Him when, when there's a trial, when we hit that bump in the road. and We only call upon Him when there's, a, uh, when, when there's a problem in our life that we just don't see past. And Hey, God wants to have a relationship with you every day, 365 days a week. No matter if it's holiday, no matter if it's a tough day, He wants us to get up early and read, our, uh, read the Word of God and spend time with Him in prayer, eat and every day. Hey, we have the right intentions. We, uh, we want to be Christian. We want to say that we're Christ's light, but we don't love people. We don't forgive people. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 22, 24 that we cannot serve God and mammon. Hey, we can't serve the world and we can't live after the world and also serve and worship God. We can't have a compromising Christianity for sake of time. I want to end uh, that point number three, but I believe in education that we're doing the right thing the wrong way. In parenting, we're doing the right thing the wrong way. In our walk with God, we're doing the right thing the wrong way. And lastly, this one's very prevalent, is in salvation. People have the right intentions. People want to go to heaven. and People want to live a godly life, but they're going about it the wrong way. Don't tell you how many times I've knocked on the door and, and introduced myself and, and asked somebody if they were to die today, if they were 100% sure they'd go to heaven. And, and they'd say yes. And I asked them, okay, uh, why, why do you know that? Or how, how do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Well, I'm a good person. They're going through life with the right intentions of salvation, but the wrong way. Hey, not only that, I've asked people, how come you're going to heaven? Well, I was baptized uh, as an infant growing up. They are trusting. Uh, they have good intentions, and they, they, they believe they're on the way to heaven, but they can believe it all they want. They're going about salvation the wrong way. Hey, I grew up in a pastor's home, and I can't tell you how many people that I know have the philosophy of, my parents are great Christians, and my parents pray for me. I've heard that. And my parents pray for me every day and I believe I'm going to heaven because of my parents prayer they have good intentions but they're going to end up with the wrong results the Bible says that I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me God is very uh, very plain and God is very d d direct he, is not, he doesn't skirt around it he doesn't say hey you can go this way or go that way he says no I am the door no man entereth, into the, uh, entereth in but by me and that's in John chapter 10 and God is very specific and says this is the only way to get to heaven is trusting what Christ did for us on that cross 2,000 years ago. Hey, we're all sinners and we're all in need of a Savior and that's what the Bible reveals to us, the Ten Commandments. Can anybody keep the, keep the Ten Commandments? Absolutely not. The Bible says if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all the commandments and the law is not there for us to live this disciplined life. No, it's there for us to reveal to us that we need a Savior. That we need Jesus Christ. That we're lost and in, incomplete and that we're incapable of getting to heaven on our own and we cannot be good enough. The Bible says our righteousness are as filthy rags but yet we're trusting in the goodness and the good things that we've done and the baptism that we were baptized as a child or maybe we don't remember talking to anybody but I remember getting baptized and we're putting our trust and faith in that to get to heaven. Let me tell you, you have good intentions but you're going to have the wrong results. You're going to wake up one day just like the rich man in Luke uh, chapter 15. He woke up and he was eternally separated from God and he woke up being in his eyes. Uh, he said he looked up and he's in flames being in torment and we're gonna, you're going to spend forever separated from God in a place called hell because you're trusting in something uh, even with good intentions you're not trusting in the right thing to get saved when you go uh, when this life is over you know God was very angry with uh, with us he, he, he killed them God was very upset with the Israelites because they did not handle the ark the proper way Hey, David, you had right intentions. I believe God realized that. But it doesn't matter with your intentions. I want you to be obedient, and I want you to do things the way that I have set up in, my word, in, in the Word of God. You know, it, it, you may not even realize you're doing it wrong until that bump happens. Hey, but then, though, it's too late. 
Hey, Uzzah, don't touch. Oop, he, he's dead. Hey, uh, Uzzah, what can you do? You can't bring Uzzah back. Hey, Uzzah, it's too late for Uzzah to realize that he did it the wrong way. David found out the hard way, but David found, if you don't mind, turn to 1 Chronicles 15, and I know what time it is. It's late. I'm going to get you out. I know you're hungry. But 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, the Bible says, And David made him houses in the city of David. This is after the story of, of uh, Uzzah being struck down. And then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark to the Lord unto his place which he had prepared for. David sometime between 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 1 Chronicles chapter 15 David found the word of God and David lived and said we're going to do it the way that God wants us to do it. Today in your life hey with education, with parenting, with a Christian walk with God and, and also with salvation let's make sure we find the right way. Hey let's find the way that God wants us to do it. It's found in in the Word of God. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. God's given us the Bible. He's given us instructions how to live our life. I believe He's given us instructions how to educate our children. I believe He's given us instructions on how to parent and how to raise our children. I know that God's given us instructions how to walk in the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit and have a relationship with God. And God has given us instructions and His illustrations on how we can trust Him as our Savior in the Bible. He's given it uh, to us. Let's find the right way. Not only find the right way, let's stay with the right way. Hey, let's not go halfway doing it right and, and, and going a, a different direction. Let's stay with the right way no matter what the world has to say. Hey, you think uh, that everybody likes Temple Christian Academy being here on this corner? Absolutely not. Public schools don't like us. Uh, they, they, they do everything they can in their power to shut us down. And They say that they tell people don't go to Temple Christian Academy. Well, let me tell you, I don't, I don't want the world to be happy with the way I've done it. I don't want the world and as a church we don't want the world telling us how to educate our children hey we're going to stay with the right way no matter what's being said about us hey today a lot of people are, are even teaching and preaching and, and preachers across America are saying that everybody's good enough and everybody's going to end up in heaven that's false and that's not true and don't worry uh, don't listen to what they're having to tell you let's stay with the right way no matter what the consequences no matter who what anybody says about us not only stay find the right way stay at the right way let's finish with the right way. The Apostle Paul says, I have fought a good fight and I have finished my course. You know, it's, it, it's very important how you start. You know, I, I love that people all the time put our kids in our kindergarten and that's important. I believe kindergarten is very, very important to have a, a godly base uh, to build upon for education. Uh, but you know what? Kindergarten's not enough. Kindergarten's not enough. Hey, elementary school is not enough. Hey, uh, you need to make sure that you have a godly foundation for your child all the way through through their upbringing. Why? Because when they turn 18 and they, they, they leave out of your house, uh, they're not going to come to you and it, it, it's too late for you to fix any problems that you miss. Let's make sure we do it right and stay doing it right and finish doing it right. Hey, loving your children is not good enough. I'm talking about parenting. It's not. you got to discipline. you got to discipline. Hey, reading a little Bible here and reading a little Bible there and praying when something bad is happening in life is not good enough. Relying on anything else to get to heaven uh, is it, it is not good enough. It's not the way that God has given us in His Word. Hey, we can have all the right intentions. David, you had the right intentions. David, you want to bring the presence of God uh, with you and have the presence of God with you as, as you're leading the country of Israel. Good job, David. Right intentions, wrong way. Us is now dead. Let's make sure that we don't suffer and our children don't suffer and as America, our next generation that's coming up behind us, it's ra that we're raising up today, that they don't suffer because because maybe it's just a little too hard to do it the right way. Hey, let's, let's focus more, and we, we have these thoughts of let's, let's make sure that the world's happy with how we're doing it. No. Let's find the right way in the Word of God. Let's stay with the right way, and let's finish with the right way. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to turn it over to preacher after I say the word of prayer, and uh, we'll, we'll dismiss in just a few minutes. Dear Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for your Word of God. Lord, thank you how it's very clear. Uh, Lord, you teach us exactly what we need to do to get to, uh, get to heaven. Lord, you, you, you've shown it. It's not by anything we do. It's, it's, it's all upon what your son did for us on the cross and believing that he died and that he rose again the third day. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for loving us. And